James Comedo Show on a Wednesday. Packed show. Stacked show. A lot of news happened this weekend. A lot of news has happened this week. We are going to get into every single bit of it. Let's look at the list. Usually when I come in here, the show is not scripted. The show is not produced by a bunch of people. We don't have writers. Uh, Usually I have one piece of paper, and it has like topics, you know, just basically bullet point topics, and maybe a sub-headline. That's it. That's all we go off of. Look at the piece of paper that I have with me today, okay? If if you're listening on iTunes and you're not watching on YouTube or you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, first, get a clue. Get a clue. Get it together. You don't want to miss the Lavish Studios. Look at this piece of paper. Look at this. Ripped with this tiniest writing, just five little bullets, ripped piece of paper, this is the production level. This is the money sunk into this program. Held together by glues and string and bubblegum over here. The show. We are going to break down Kendall Jenner's Pepsi Cola ad fiasco. An absolute disaster. We'll also break into Nivea's little ad problem. Uh, they also made a little ad whoopsie poopsie. Tony Romo retired. We'll talk about his career. Talk about really what he did on the field. You know, he's a really polarizing figure who I have defended for a long time. So I'm ready to talk about Romo and, and set all the haters right. Of course, we will talk about the college basketball national title and also how the universe hates me. Uh, Katy Perry had a bad couple of days, so she shows what she does to get her confidence back. I will give you a hint. It involves her Googling images of herself looking incredible. And, of course, WrestleMania was this weekend. We won't break down all of WrestleMania. This isn't a wrestling podcast, but we will talk about the show of shows and what WrestleMania means to me. So let's go ahead and get into this thing. Let's quit messing around here. So Kendall Jenner, if you you haven't heard of this story, don't feel bad. Okay, if you haven't heard of this story, if you're like, what happened? What happened with with, uh, Pepsi? It's okay. It's okay. This is one of those stories that happened, and I'm actually kind of embarrassed that we're talking about it, but we have to, because that's what we do. We tell you everything you need to know to have a conversation at the water cooler about any topic through the lenses of me. So, Kendall is the new Cindy Crawford for Pepsi. Cindy Crawford was Pepsi's superstar model. She was their their cover girl, their commercial person. They, They focused their marketing around Cindy Crawford. Now it's Kendall Jenner. Not a bad pick. Not a bad pick. Superstar family. Superstar in her own right. You know, huge on social media. Young, so you got her for a long time. And she's also a model. Not a bad combination at all. So, by the way, this story is so 2017, 2016, the way our climate is right now, I can't even stand it. So Kendall's in this commercial uh, for Pepsi, and the commercial starts off. We won't play the commercial. You know, I don't want to get get copyrighted or whatever. Starts off with her modeling. She's wearing like a blonde wig, and she's modeling. So she takes the blonde wig off, revealing her normal hair. She wipes her lipstick off. You know, real real edgy. Just just a whole forearm. Whoa, rips the lipstick off. And she walks out of the studio, and she goes out into the streets. Out in the streets is some protesting, some rioting. You know, police are on one side, protesters are on the other side, and Kendall bravely, armed with a weapon of justice that I will not reveal yet, armed with a weapon of justice, walks out with a stone cold look on her face. She's ready to right some social wrongs. Everything that you thought was unfair, all the injustices, Kendall Jenner's on it. Kendall Jenner is about to stop it all. One step, two step. She's getting closer to the protesters. Smoke bombs are whizzing by her head. It's getting nasty out there. There's curse words flying. It's a scene. It's a terrifying scene. Three steps, four steps. She's getting closer. You can almost feel the tension, the police. Riot shields up, not backing down. The protesters believe in what they're fighting for, screaming at the police. They don't, they don't even notice Kendall Jenner. She continues. Most would stop. Most would have turned around. I know I would have. 
But damn it, I'm not Kendall Jenner. Kendall Jenner keeps on walking. She's now face to face with the policeman. The policeman, confused. Who is this woman? Who is this brave woman walking through these violent times? It's Kendall Jenner, damn it. Kendall Jenner then raises her hand. Clenched in her fist is the aforementioned weapon of justice. The only thing that can stop a time like this. The only thing that can quell the violence and the tension. She reaches towards the man, the police officer, who, who's stunned. Who's got a family, kids and a wife at home. Well, he may never see again. He doesn't know, but he doesn't care. Why? Because he's wearing the badge. And when he put on the badge that morning, he put it on knowing that he may never return home again. And he's in a situation that his life's on the line. But thank God, thank God, Kendall Jenner is there. He looks her in the eyes, confused. What are you doing? She doesn't say a word. Silence. She instead offers him the weapon of justice, the weapon of peace that's in her hand. What is it, you may ask? It is a blue can of Pepsi Cola. The man grabs it. That's my Coke. That's my Pepsi can uh, sound effect. Takes a swig. He smiles. He looks at the protesters who have now stopped protesting. Why protest? Pepsi's here. They're now laughing, jovial, jumping around. Oh, the police are now intertwined with the protesters. It's all good, baby. The Pepsi has solved it all. Pepsi, thank you. Thank you, Pepsi. And the commercial basically is that for another uh, another few minutes. The commercial is basically Kendall Jenner going to different locations, offering Pepsi to protesters, and stopping the protesting, stopping the issue via Pepsi. Kendall Jenner armed only with Pepsi and good looks, has stopped and is stopping all social injustices, all problems, thanks to Pepsi. Now, people did not like this. People really, really didn't like this. You know, they thought that it was tone deaf, which it is. They thought that it's making light of the protest, which it is. They thought that it's making light of basically the entire situation just to sell Pepsi and to use it as a platform for their commercials, which, it, it, of course, it is. And this is one of those topics where, usually on this show, we get a little, we rant, we get a little nuts. You know, we, we, we don't mince words, right? We're, we, our finger is constantly on the pulse of America, and the world, really. And if a topic, if there's a topic that's pushed the limits, and if I feel wronged, and if I feel that you are wronged, then we will stand up here and we will shout and scream, and I will deliver monologue after monologue after monologue telling you why it's wrong. This situation, not so much. This situation is really not a, I mean, it's a, guys, it's a Pepsi commercial. It's a Pepsi, Pepsi commercial with a Kardashian slash Jenner. I'm, I'm not sure what the difference is. But with a Kardashian slash Jenner in the middle of it, who does not care at all. People are like, well, Ken, I can't believe Kendall went along with this. Kendall cashed a check, showed up to the set, and did the commercial and left. I guarantee you she wasn't pouring over the script thinking, you know, this may rustle some feathers with the social warriors out there. I don't think she really cared. I don't think there was a script. It was probably, uh, Kendall, can you just walk down the stairs, hand the Pepsi to the police officer, and then you know, we'll see you later. I don't think this is really one of those things where where she poured over it too much. On I can understand why people are upset. Well, maybe not upset. Upset's a little much for this kind of thing. But I can I can tell why people feel like it's tone deaf because it is. It's using a topic, a very serious topic, a very topical topic, something that's happening every day, something we see every day, and using it to sell Pepsi. And it is making light of it. But it is just a commercial, a Pepsi commercial with Kendall Jenner here. So it's almost so ridiculous that it's hard to take serious. It's hard to be like, I am offended by Pepsi's commercial. Commercials are kind of always on that line anyways of being ridiculous or being offensive. And, and sometimes and this one just kind of felt, you know, on both sides. 
So I wouldn't get too riled up in this. I really wouldn't. I, I wouldn't get too riled up. It's ridiculous. Uh, Pepsi pulled the, pulled the commercial already. They apologized. Said they didn't mean for it to be as tone deaf, you know, as it was. It came off as, you know, they they try to explain it. They apologize to Kendall for putting Kendall in that situation. I'm sure she's mortified. Wink. I'm sure she's going to lose a lot of sleep over this. Wink, wink. So, but the uh, the other commercial. While we're on the ad thing, another commercial. Uh, Nivea, the face cream, the beauty cream. I guess. Um, they came out with a commercial that maybe is a little more offensive, but uh, their big tagline on this on their new product is uh, white purity, which you know, not sure how they didn't think that that may be taken a little a little rough, but it's not a big deal. You know, uh, Nivea is a, a blue collar American company that you know that. Oh wait, what is it? Oh. Wow, they're oh they're a German company. Ooh, yeah. Um, there wasn't anyone in the boardroom that might have been like, you know what, guys? This kind of sounds like something that you know that that other guy might have said a few years ago. Uh, you want to kind of change up the wording? Wh- what? You think someone's going to take white purity and make that into a racial situation? Race issues are fine nowadays. It's 2017. No one cares about black or white issues. You think someone's going to take white purity and, and use it as a reason to bring up Zafiha? No one's brought up Hitler in years. America just had a presidential race. They didn't bring up Hitler at all. White supremacist and Nazi. That's out of culture. No one remembers that. No one's going to think white purity. No, no one's going to think that's a thing. Damn. Damn, Nivea. I really think it's crazy because, you know, these aren't one people's show. You know, like if I did something and someone thought it was tone deaf or offensive, I'm the last line of this production. You know, I write the, even the shows when I do the uh, the news shows on my YouTube channel. There's only one person writing these things. So if I don't think it's offensive, it's just going to, it's just going to happen. These things are multi-million dollar companies with dozens of people working on these things. When Pepsi got with Kendall Jenner, 15, 20, however many people sat in a room and said, okay, let's pitch ideas. And they threw ideas, threw ideas at the wall until finally they all agreed that this commercial was the best way to do it. Same with Nivea. This is a team that all had ideas, threw it, brainstormed, and came. it came down to them saying that, yeah, we like how the way we like the way white purity sounds. We think that gets our product across very well. White purity. That's what we want. No doubt about it. Book it. Put it on there. White effing purity. Bad day. Bad day for ad agencies. Let's move on a little bit. Let's move on, shall we? Let's go to Katy Perry. So Katy Perry surprisingly kind of has fallen out of the public eye. You know, she did the Super Bowl performance. She hasn't really come out with a lot of new music. Our music kind of is no Teenage Dream. You know, back, I mean, she was, she was dropping some classics. Teenage Dream is a classic. No other way to put it. No, if, I mean, you, you can't argue with me here. It, it is a, an American classic. So, but her Instagram is incredibly popular. And she put out a couple pictures that were not flattering. So she said, Here's I, this is what I do to boost my self confidence, and it's a picture, a screenshot from her cell phone where she Googled Katy Perry hot, and it's a picture of her looking incredible. You know, Daisy Dukes on, uh, she's spilling out from her bra. It's it's very provocative, and I won't show it because for God's sake, if this is nothing, it's a kids show. That's that's really the demographic we're going for here. So we're not going to show that. We're not going to show. It. And if you're listening on iTunes or, or, Spot, or uh, Stitcher or Audio Mac, then you won't be tempted to see it. But I always thought about this. Because if I was a celebrity and I had done tons of photo shoots and tons of magazine covers and all these photoshopped images where I'm, I'm made to look incredible, I would constantly look at them. Constantly look at them. Anytime I woke up and I was like, God, having a bad day. Instead of reaching for some cheap booze like I do now, I would just Google search myself, see all this awesome stuff that I've done, and, and that's it. 
and then I'm feeling great again. It's like a constant cup of coffee. It's like co- it's like coffee without the risk of dehydration and, and too much caffeine. It's, it's just the perfect pick-me-up that won't affect your sleep, won't affect any of that stuff. Imagine if whenever you Google searched your name, it was just like, oh, wow, that's an incredible photo shoot I did. I look incredible. Oh, here's me winning an award at an award show. Well, that was awesome. Oh, here's my net worth. Oh, here's my house. Here's this. Here's this. Here's blogs written about how awesome I am. Perfect. You got to think celebrities do this all the damn time. I, I mean, I'm not a high ego person. But if I was, I would just nonstop fill my search history with stuff of myself. The fact that my house has 15 to 20 mirrors in it doesn't mean anything. I need the Google search. I need this to happen. Someone, I need a professional photographer to do a shoot for this show. That's what I want. A shoot for the show. Have you have you seen the the graphic, the pod to, the iTunes graphic for the podcast? That I had to put that together. I had to take that picture. I had to. You know how hard it is to pose for a picture while clicking the take picture button. It's not easy to do without looking like a selfie. So I'm, you know, in real life, you're seeing me basically do it, the splits to try and reach the camera while looking like my arms are at my side, while taking a picture, then editing the picture, and I'm taking it with a cheap camera. I'm, you know, I'm not taking it with some studio camera, so it doesn't look great anyways. If I just had people nonstop taking awesome photos of me, that's heaven. That's heaven. Let's move on from Katy Perry. Tony Romo retired, guys. Tony Romo, incredibly polarizing figure. In maybe the most polarizing football player in certainly in my lifetime. I cannot I can't think of I wasn't prepared to say that, but now that I've said it, I can't think of anyone more polarizing. Tony Romo, the reason that he was so polarizing, because yes, he was good, and people agree that he was good. You know, you can't agree that he was bad. But then you split right into it into a segment of people that thought he was really good and that he was a great quarterback, you know, top top one of the top guys in the NFL, and he was just kind of getting unlucky and, you know, his teams weren't ever that great or circumstances were happening. Then you have this other segment who think that he's not he's not great. He's just kind of a flashy guy who, you know, get put the staff the stat stuffer, puts up crazy numbers, but never wins the big games all because of him. He's not clutch, all this other stuff. And that's really the two that's where that's where we are, right? That's that's the two sects that are really arguing. I don't think anyone's doubting that he was good. It's just how good or how bad was he? Was he overrated? Is he underrated? Very polarizing figure. I have always said that Tony Romo has been good. Really good. I, I thought he was a great NFL quarterback. And it's not it's really not easy, okay? For the Dallas Cowboys. And before he got there, the Cowboys were in a bad stretch. They had Quincy Carter, you know, they had Drew Henson. They they were not a great team. Romo comes, the team all of a sudden has a quarterback. Handsome, out of Eastern Illinois, absolutely nobody knows who he is, undrafted, great story, a little bit of a gunslinger, a little bit of a Brett Favre mentality, fantastic for marketing, fantastic for Dallas. He's the quarterback of the future. Then the team starts to get a little bit better. They're still not great. You know, their running backs are still Julius Randle or, or who, who, who was it? Julius Randle's a basketball player. Who We had Marion Barber, I know, for a little bit there. Was Julius Randle a – was he a running back? I'll have to look that up. I'm, th- I'm thinking of whoever was the running back out of Notre Dame. We will look that up after the show. And God, I hope it's Julius Randle. But, you know, his wide receivers, Roy Williams was in there at, at one point. T.O. was in there at one point. And then they get Des Bryant. And, and the team starts to change a little bit, and they become really good, but never a true. I, I would say Romo had one year where he could have been a true NFC champion caliber team, and that was the year they lost to Green Bay with the with the Des Bryant catch thing. So it all started with Romo the botched extra point in the playoff game, I think against Seattle, where Romo had the box, box, botched extra point. I just botched the word botch like you never heard and what I said then was that his job is not to hold an extra point he's a quarterback yeah I know that he's there for a reason yeah I know they practice it and all that stuff but that's not what he does like he's not he's the quarterback he's doing if I'm going to judge a quarterback 
I'm judging them on interceptions, what they do in the pocket, how you know controlling the game. I'm not really worried about how great they can hold an extra point. And I, I understand that was his job. But it's hard for me to be like, he's not a clutch quarterback. Oh, yeah, what'd he do? Uh, he fumbled a snap on an extra point. See what I'm saying? Yes, he shouldn't shouldn't have, but that doesn't make him a bad quarterback. So then he got this the whole thing where he's not clutch. Very, very hard to dismiss that. Very hard to dismiss the notion that you're not you're not a clutch guy. You're you're not a gamer. In, in the last couple of minutes, you're gonna fold. Once that's stuck on you, it's very difficult to lose it. Very difficult, and it's not good for quarterbacks or any player in any sport to, to, for people to believe you're not clutch. Because then stats don't matter. Then it's all subjective. It's all, ha, 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 Tony Romo is going to throw the game away. Ha, ha, ha. And you start seeing all these memes and jokes, and then it just gets worse and worse and worse. And the fact that you're actually really good in clutch situations doesn't matter. Like LeBron James. People didn't think LeBron was clutch for a long time. And it, was, and it was like, are you not watching LeBron? Are you not watching him make all these threes? Are you not watching him tie the game? Are you not watching him score? every single point for three quarters in the playoffs against Detroit? Are you not watching any of that stuff? People don't believe that Michael Jordan ever missed a game when he shot. What was it? What, he missed like 26 of them or something like that? So the clutch thing, incredibly subjective. And people put Romo on the bad side of it. So that was a hill for him to climb. Then the next worst thing that can possibly happen to a quarterback or athlete, he started to get injured, he started to get the injury bug. So then not only was he not clutch, then all of a sudden he wasn't durable and he couldn't play through a season and he was weak and he was fragile. So Romo was starting to take hits, big time hits on his career. And, you know, even when he was this past off season, when people were saying, well, why would you, why would the Texans or why would the Broncos want Tony Romo? And my argument was when he's on the field, he's incredibly productive. I mean, this is a guy who led Dallas to whatever they were when they went and played Green Bay. You know, they were like 14 and two or 12 and four. I mean, they were really good. And the year before that, I think he won his first however many games before he got hurt. So you're talking about a guy that's coming off of like a 20, like a 20 and four situation. It's not, he's not, he's not a loser. And so then people would say, well, he's just going to get hurt. And my response to that would be, well, then who cares? If he's not on the field, he can't do anything about it. You, no one wants to get hurt. No one is trying to get hurt. Getting hurt, getting injured, Yes, people are injury prone. People can be more susceptible to injuries, but that's not him. He's not bad because of that. That's just something that happened at the end of his career. And he had a back issue. He's had, you know, his hands, some other issues. That doesn't make him fragile, or excuse me, that doesn't make him bad. It, it, it just, it's out of his control, just like the extra point. The extra point doesn't make him a bad quarterback. It, it's a bad thing that happened that makes him look not clutch, but. What does that have to do with him being a great quarterback? So let's go ahead and look at some numbers real quick at Tony Romo. Because if you ask people to, for Tony Romo's stats, they're kind of confused. Because it's he, he, everything is so subject, subjective that people don't really worry about his stats. So let's look at it. So he, he, went, he joined the Cowboys in 2003 through his first pass in 2006. So in his career, he has 34,183 yards and 248 touchdown passes. The touchdown passes are ninth most in NFL history amongst quarterbacks who play their entire career with one team. He is third in Cowboys history with uh, 78 touchdown passes, trailing Troy Aikman and Roger Staubach. And let's see. uh, He has a career passer rating of 97.1, which is the fourth best in NFL history. The 78 was wins. I, I, I didn't mention that. It was wins in Cowboy history with trailing Troy Aikman and Roger Staubach. Romo had a career passer rating of 97.1, which is the fourth best in NFL history with a minimum of 1,000 pass attempts. The only people better than him are Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, and Tom Brady as far as as far as far career passer rating. With Rodgers is 104.1, Russell Wilson is 99.6, and Brady's 97.2. That alone... Is pretty amazing. Fourth best in history. You're talking about Joe Montana. You're talking about Peyton Manning. Not on this list. Of, 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 above Tony Romo. 97-1. That's not bad. Obviously, it's fourth best. That, But you can't be bad. You can't be a bad quarterback and have that kind of number. 
right? So in his first nine, uh, in his first nine seasons, he started 123 out of 138 possible games. So he's durable, right? He, during that period, he was durable. During that period, he was doing his thing. During that time period, he was fine. So the injury bug thing. In later on, in the twilight of his career, yes, definitely a problem. And that's why he's retired. But that stat right there for nine straight seasons, he's playing a ton of games. And he's obviously durable. Now let's go, let's go into the clutch situation. So people believe that Tony Romo is not clutch, right? From 2006, when he started playing, until 2014, Romo led 27 game-winning drives in the fourth quarter and overtime. That is the most in the NFL over that span. The most, number one. More than Peyton Manning, more than Matt Ryan, more than Tom Brady. Most game-winning drives in the NFL over the course of from 2006 to 2014. 75 of Romo's 248 career touchdown passes came in the fourth quarter. Pretty sporty. In the fourth quarter, during the same time period, 2006, 2014, 2015, he had the NFL ranked, he had the number one completion percentage, number one yards per attempt, number four touchdown to interception ratio, and the sixth best total QBR. And this is out of quarterbacks with 500 plays. This isn't about guys who've played two snaps. So he was clutch. If anything, he was one of the most clutch players. And it's crazy because of jokes and memes and, and, and this kind of underlying angle that isn't true that people don't even have a clue how good he actually was in the fourth quarter in these clutch situations. I don't really care what you think about Tony Romo as a person, whether he's kind of goofy or whether you're jealous or whatever. The bottom line is he was clutch. And you have to understand that. The numbers that I just gave you prove that he is a clutch player. It's impossible to look at those numbers and say, yeah, but he wasn't clutch. He was, obviously, very clutch. That is, a, that is a conversation that has to end, that has to be done. It's not fair to Tony Romo to believe that when these numbers are incredibly opposite of those, of those initial beliefs. I think Tony Romo, I actually read, was reading earlier if he was a Hall of Famer or not. And I, I thought I would I thought that I would initially believe he was, but I don't I don't think he is. As weird as that is to say, because I don't. I mean, he was really, really, really good, in my opinion. But I think a quarterback does have to win, and he's only won two playoff games. I think he's only been in like five. Or four or six. He's like two and four, two and three. He hadn't played in a lot of them. And, you know, football is a team game with two sides of the ball. You have, you know, 11. I mean, there's a whole side of the ball where he doesn't play on the field. It's not like basketball where you're playing the entire game. I mean, imagine if Michael Jordan only played when the Bulls had the ball. You know, so it's, it's hard to it's hard to put winning on one player. But for a quarterback, I just feel it's so important. I just feel that. I don't know if I would vote for him to be in the Hall of Fame. Because, yeah, he had great regular season stats. And, yeah, he was a great player. But there's something to be said about just never doing it in the playoffs and never being in the playoffs, you know, never being in these games. It's one thing if you are you have 12 wins and 15 losses or whatever and you're kind of mediocre in the playoffs like Peyton Manning. But Romo didn't really get the chance to be mediocre in the playoffs. He just wasn't there. They would either lose in the first round or not make it at all or get a bye then lose. And like I said, I mean, for that, for this kind of a career and this kind of numbers that I'm telling you, he really didn't really even have the chance in the playoffs. So I don't think he's a Hall of Famer, but I do think he's a really good player, one of the better quarterbacks in Dallas Cowboy history, did a ton for the, for the franchise that at that point was struggling. And... Just like Tom Brady, it's easy to hate the quarterbacks who are handsome. It's easy to hate the quarterbacks with the hot girlfriends. It's easy to hate that. But I think with Tony Romo, we need to put that aside and just kind of agree that he was a fun player to watch. He was a great player. He made Dallas exciting. And 
I think we should all show him the respect he deserves. Uh, real quick, we're, we're, I didn't realize we were already over the time limit here, but we'll, we'll go into this, to the March Madness, the uh, National Championship final, and we'll skip WrestleMania. We'll put that for another podcast because that could get nasty. That could get long. But I'm not going to break down the whole game. And if I did this yesterday, if I would have done this the day after the game, I was so angry. Because I've said on this show, everyone knows that I needed Gonzaga to win. I led my bracket group from the tip-off of the first game to the national championship. That's like three weeks. I was in the win- I was in the driver's seat of my bracket pool. Like, wow, I'm really, this, this is really good, this is really good, this is really good. And then it came down to Gonzaga or North Carolina. And exactly what I needed to happen with North Carolina. They shot 33%. They were terrible. They didn't look like North Carolina. Only problem is, Gonzaga was even worse. Gonzaga, in the second half, was making me want to puke all over my chest. They went seven minutes without a field goal. Seven minutes without a field goal. Brutal. Seven minutes of basketball time. Not seven minutes of just hanging around my living room. So in hanging around my living room time, it's like 30 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. I'm sitting there waiting for them to score. North Carolina goes down, doesn't score. Gonzaga comes down, doesn't score. And that happens for five or six times. The game was a disaster from every aspect. Not just Gonzaga, not just North Carolina. The game was a mess. The refs absolutely... I know this is going to sound like I'm being biased. But the refs absolutely took over that game. They called like 42 fouls in 37 minutes. They called one foul where they called a foul on Joel Berry, North Carolina player, and on a simultaneous play called a flagrant foul on Karnowski from Gonzaga. So we saw Joel Berry go shoot his free throws. Then we saw Karnowski go shoot his free throws. It was just a free throw party. Collins, the freshman from Gonzaga, fouled out and... I, unless the fouls are really, really, really egregious, you shouldn't be fouling out players in the national championship. This is not a time for ticky-tack calls. Okay, You don't want a game of this magnitude to be decided by the referees or to have the referees impact at all. In a big game like that, Super Bowl, national championship, World Series, uh, national, uh, the college basketball national title game, you don't want the situation to be, well... They made a lot of free throws, or, well, they fouled out, or, well, that call was pretty much it. You want it to be for these players. These players have played for three weeks. They have won, what, four games? The first round, second round, so Sweet 16, Elite 8, Final Four, now they're here. And you're going to take the game over like this? The referees should be ashamed of themselves. And I'm not just saying this because Gonzaga lost. All right? It was brutal to watch from any side. If I would have had North Carolina, I'd be a whole lot happier today, and I wouldn't be stuck eating these Vienna sausages but I would be just as mad that I watched that game. They complete. I mean, the fact that Collins got that fourth foul, which was as ticky-tack as it gets, then Meeks gets a fourth foul, which is equally as ticky-tack. I mean, if Meeks fouls out and Collins fouls out, Kornowski's on a fourth foul, all of a sudden if this game goes into overtime and we have to sit through while the best players on each team are sitting on the bench, it's a disservice to the fans, it's a disservice to the players, it's a disservice to the, to the people watching at home or watching in the stadium. And people are like, well, I'm surprised the game got, was kind of as high scoring as it was considering how bad they were. What? They each shot 40-something free throws. The game should have been in the 30s. The game could have easily been in the 30s and 40s. But because they both tacked on 20, 25 points of free throws, we got a game in the 60s. It reminded me of that Duke-Butler game where Butler shot like 16% in the first half and it was awful. And that'll happen. That will happen. But the free throws, the and ones, the ridiculous fouls, the stopping of the games, the three-minute replays, all that stuff. It was too much. And then, at the very end of the game, they miss a blatant, obvious out-of-bounds on North Carolina, gave North Carolina the possession. It was down one with 48 seconds left. And the referees decide at that point to blow the biggest call of the game, even though they've made... Well, I say blow it. They didn't replay. They didn't, they didn't have a chance to look at it. They just blew it and then kept on going. After they replayed everything, it, it, it made me feel like that was not the two best teams in the nation. It totally overshadowed North Carolina's win. And this is what I will say about North Carolina. I feel bad about North Carolina 
because last year they lost on a last second buzzer beater and made a great redemption story back to the national championship. And it totally, totally was overshadowed by how bad the game was, how slow the game was, and how terrible his referees were. So this is, doesn't just affect me and Gonzaga. This also affects North Carolina. No one's going to remember, wow, I can't believe they got back to the national championship, the same players, the redemption angle, all that cool stuff. They're just going to remember the fouls, the blown call at the end of the game, and these referees trying to steal the show from these kids. It's an, it's an embarrassment for the referees. It's an embarrassment for college basketball. And when you invest that much time into one tournament, three weeks, of watching these games and watching these players and watching the process, and the very last game is totally ruined, it, it does put a terrible, terrible taste in your mouth. I have the worst taste ever in my mouth. Ever. I mean, I, I feel like this season was wasted. I don't feel like North Carolina is the national champions. Yeah, I know they won the game. I'm not saying Gonzaga should have won the game, but I'm saying that just the way the game played out, with the fouls, with the time, with the length of the reviews, all that stuff. I don't feel like North Carolina is the deserving champion. I really don't. If Gonzaga would have won, I wouldn't feel like they were a deserving champion. You have to go back to like three games to be like, oh yeah, okay, they were playing really good basketball. They probably do deserve to win it. If North Carolina plays like that against Kentucky, Kentucky beats them by 20. And if Gonzaga plays like that against, shoot, who, who they play in the second round, they're getting beat by 20. So, I mean, I don't know if they need to space the games out more where they play the Final Four on Saturday, turn around for the National Championship on Wednesday, give them a couple of extra days rest because they did look tired. But they got to fix something. Something's broken with, with, the national, with, with that garbage. <sighs> Damn it. But congratulations to Joe Saban, who beat me in the bracket pool. It was either me or him was going to win that thing. And he beat me. Joe, if you're listening to the podcast, congrats. I'll never speak to you again. I hate you more than anything on the on this earth. You're my number one villain. Just the thought of you makes me sick and want, makes me want to puke all over the place. But congrats, you earned it. Congrats. I hope you spend the money on or, or uh, the funsies on something something important. Don't no don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. Rice and beans are the best. This is it, guys. That's gonna be it for the show. I hope you enjoyed it. We went a little long, but you know. Sometimes I just go. I just get going. Not to mention, I mean, you shouldn't be complaining about me going long because I'm saving you the time that you have to listen to those other nobodies that they have on your local drive time radio show. I mean, what a joke. Guys, if you're new to the show, please hit subscribe. We're doing this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you are a recurring member, recurring member of this show, supporter of this show, and haven't rated or reviewed the show, what are you doing? We've got 10 five-star ratings coming right now. Every day, people are hitting that five-star, leaving reviews. That's how this show's going to get out there. That's how the visibility gets expanded. By the reviews, by the shares, by the likes, by the comments, by all that stuff. So thanks, guys. Again, this has been the James Scumetta Show. <laughs>